hey, hey, Dan, seriously, eyes down here on my face. Well, I'm busy Look looking at me. Look at me. At it. That's a Look at me. Hey. It is not a, don't say it, that it is, is a, not a moose. That is it is a, not a moose. That is a good it looking is an moose. Elk. It is a, an elk. Good God, do they not teach you anything useful at UT? That is a good looking moose, my Can we start now? Seriously? Howdy, y'all. This is Dr. Jarvis, and I want to give you a quick update on some tips about using the King Vision for intubation. The tips that I want to do, none of these are really new, but I see these issues pop up in the intubation report forms, and I feel like sometimes it's worthy of a quick reminder. So I want to go over some things that can help you succeed with using the King Vision, and particularly using the King Vision on patients with really fouled, nasty airways. So those are some of the things that we see as reasons for missing on the first attempt. So number one, the King Vision is not just a direct laryngoscope with a camera on it. I think you all know that, but perhaps for some of our newer medics, the thing to remember is you use it differently than you used direct laryngoscopy. Direct laryngoscopy, as a reminder, is a displacing technology. So you have to move the mandible and those tissues out of the way so you can get direct line of sight with the glottic opening. With a King Vision and with other devices that have a hyperacute angled blade, you don't have to move the tissues out of the way. And as a matter of fact, if you do move the tissues out of the way, you're going to end up screwing yourself down the line. So instead of moving the tissues out of the way, it's a non-displacing technology where you use the curve to look around the curve, look around the curve of the mandible and see the glottic opening. So it's not just DL with a camera on it. Next thing is if you want to succeed, prep for success. And you do that in two ways. Number one, you do it mentally. If you go into an intubation, actually for that matter, if you go into any procedure with the idea, with a voice in the back of your head that you're going to miss this procedure, then you're going to miss the procedure. So if you go back to Caddyshack and think about Danny on the green, no, 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 be the ball. I'm gonna give you a little advice. There's a force in the universe that makes things happen. And all you have to do is get in touch with it. Stop thinking. Let things happen. And be the ball. Danny? Danny? <laughs> sir? Where's the uh, wedge? Right here, sir. Thank you, Danny. Be the ball. Be the ball. Know that you're going to get this tube in the cords on the first pass. So convince yourself, prep yourself in your mind for success and be that intubation. Next is put your patient in a position that's going to help you succeed. Just because you can intubate a patient upside down in the rain, in the mud, while people are shooting at you in a ditch, doesn't mean you should. It means that that is going to be a much more difficult intubation. Change your environment to increase the chances of first pass success. And what that typically looks like outside cardiac arrest is you sit the patient up, you move them onto your stretcher so you can manipulate the environment, change the environment. If the patient is wrapped around a commode and he just elvised himself and he's now in a bradyacystolic arrest, move him so that you can do adequate CPR and get a good look with your intubation. Next, it, I think this probably goes without saying, but do not hold the laryngoscope by the handle. I realize that's what they put it there for, but take my word for it, hold it low and light. And what I mean by low and light is you should hold it with just three fingers, put your thumb where the channel comes out from the blade, where the color changes. So hold it very low, very light, and that will set you up for success. It will help prevent you from going too deep with the intubation attempt. Next is suction. Suck early, suck often. Remember the protocol, the checklist says go in with your suction first. So there are a couple of reasons for that. Number one is one of the main reasons we miss intubations is because we find out that the airway is soiled once we put the tip of the blade in and we immediately spooge the camera and we're not able to see after that. I think everybody now is at least having the suction in the oropharynx before they insert the blade. So that's good, we're making progress, but I don't think we're aggressively suctioning. So we have to be very, very aggressive 
with our suction efforts. Uh, we need to get everything out of the way. So that's number one. Number two is that King Vision blade is wider than a normal DL blade. Sometimes it's hard to actually get it into the oropharynx. Use your rigid suction tip as a tongue blade. Lift the mandible out of the way and then you can slide the King Vision blade in more easily. Next, as you're going in, you've suctioned aggressively. You are moving the tongue and the mandible out of the way. Get your blade and as you go in, don't hub the blade into the oropharynx. You want to get a good idea of what's in the oropharynx, so put just the tip in first and then walk the tip of the blade around the tongue. Make sure you're always in contact with the tongue to keep that blade as anteriorly as possible because if there is some crap in the airway that you've missed, it's going to be in the dependent spaces. It's going to be in the posterior area. That's what you want to keep the camera out of. Remember, with this device, you go in midline. You don't have to go in off to the patient's right and sweep to the left. Midline insertion, suck early, suck often, suck aggressively, look down, open the oropharynx, and with your eyes, look in the oropharynx, not in the camera. Put the blade in and aim for the uvula. Once you see the uvula, then look up at the camera right as you're starting to go around the corner. Keep the tip of the blade in contact with the tongue and slowly walk around. And while you're doing it, you want to make sure that the tip of the suction is distal to the tip of the blade. If it is proximal to the blade, it's not doing you any good. So make sure that you're aggressively suctioning further down past the tip of the blade. Let's say that there is a massive amount of emesis. I don't want it. I don't want it. Man. Peter, Peter, I need you to hold my ears. Oh, oh. Who wants chowder? Typically, this is not going to be emesis because these patients usually are not continuously vomiting. They may be continuously regurgitating, but there's a finite amount of puke. You can eventually get to the bottom of it. Where we're typically seeing this is in bleeding and hematemesis. So if you have massive amounts of blood coming up, um, you may need to divert that blood out of the way. So there are two ways that you can do this. So you've suctioned aggressively, and as you're going down, you notice that you're just not, as soon as you um, back the tip of the suction up a little bit, the levels just come up. The key thing to do there is just take or your suction cap and hub it into the esophagus. Use that as an orogastric tube. Go all the way down so you're trying to divert the stream of yak um, up before it hits the camera. Now if that doesn't work, if now we all know that we're using the decanto catheter, that great big um, diameter catheter, but even if that's not enough, the next thing to do is just take the ET tube off of your uh, blade or grab a second ET tube, and if you have an 8O, this would work even better, and intentionally intubate the esophagus. Take that tube, push it all the way down into the esophagus, inflate the balloon, and slide it off to the side. Now, an important safety tip here, this is a pro tip, when you put that into the esophagus, um, remember that whatever was in there is now going to be coming up the tip. So make sure if you have a student with you, you're pointing it at your student. You're pointing it somewhere other than your nice clean uniform. So move it off to the side and now hopefully you're using this as a diversionary technique to keep stuff out of the airway. You can still suction your way down, rotate around the tongue. Now hopefully you'll be able to get a cleaner shot. Let's say that you're going down and you're not able to get the tube where you want it to go. You have a great view, and, and remember what we define as a great view. As you're walking that tip down the uh, curvature of the tongue, you're trying to find landmarks that you recognize, and the number one landmark you have to find is the epiglottis. So do this concept of epiglottoscopy. Make sure that you can clearly visualize the epiglottis. Once you see that, you know where you are, then go to indirectly lift that epiglottis up and you're looking for the view. You want to see the epiglottis at the top of your screen. You want to see the arytenoid cartilage at the bottom, and you want to see at least part of the vocal cords. Now, remember, if you see a wonderful view of the epiglottis, if you see a wonderful view of the cords, there's a pretty good chance you're too deep. So one thing to look for is something called COVAC sign. 
Kovac sign is if you're looking down through the glottic opening, past the vocal cords, and you're actually seeing cricoid rings, you're too damn deep. This is something that is specific to this hyperacute blade because the angle of the blade, it's going to be difficult for your tube to go around that blade, come back up anteriorly, and get into the cords if you're that deep. So if you don't see the epiglottis, back up. If you see cricoid rings, back up because you're too deep. But let's say that you have the view, you have the epiglottis in position, you're not too deep, you don't see the entire structure, you're trying to pass the tube in, but the tube is coming off to the right of the vocal cords, or the tube is hanging on the arytenoid cartilage. There are a couple of things you can do. Number one, you need to rotate the tube around. And remember the way you do that is you grab the distal tip of the ET tube and rotate it around. Rotate it around in front of your camera, and that hyper-aggressive movement, that dramatic movement, will rotate the angle of the tip around the arytenoid cartilage, hopefully give you a better approach through the cords. Now that's not going to work if your bevel of your ET tube is hung on the arytenoids. So before you start to rotate, back up a little bit, rotate, and then re-engage. As a reminder, if that doesn't work, if you still can't get the tube in, you can go ahead and advance your bougie and try to manipulate the bougie. And if none of that works, another option that you can do is if you can take your suction catheter and actually put it right up to the cords, put it on top of those arytenoid cartilages, then you can disengage the suction, feed the bougie through the suction cath, and use that suction cath as an introducer for the bougie then back your suction catheter up over the bougie and slide an ET tube over the bougie using it as an introducer. So those are some tips, some things that I think will help you get your patient intubated. And as a reminder, these are things that we're seeing on those intubation forms that you're filling out. And thank you very much for filling those out. I really can't tell you how much they help us identify where we're having difficulties and coming up with strategies that help us overcome them. So thanks a lot. As always, if you have any questions, give me a call, send me a text message, come by the office. Have a great day. Oh yeah, a yak stream. That, it's oh, a yak, I knew love it. I knew it. God so damn, moose, it is yak. not a yak, it's not a moose, it's not a deer. It is an elk, elk, E-L-K, elk, not a yak. Yak is what we suction out of an airway. That is a majestic beast. Hey Jeff. Not a yak. Hey, Jeff. It's not a yak. Nice it's yak. It's not a moose. Nice yak, buddy. It's